And now for something completely different. Hello everybody, Hooded Corps Commander 788 here. It is time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and this week we are going very vintage indeed. Now normally on this channel we look at G.I. Joe from the 1980s and a little bit from the 1990s, uh, but this week we are going back to the very roots of G.I. Joe. If you've watched this channel for very long, then you've noticed that history is very important to this channel. Uh, by better understanding where you've been, then you can better understand where you are. And that helps you better understand where you're going. It's important to look back and to look forward. And we're going to do both with this review. We're going to go back to 1964 and look at the first G.I. Joe. To paraphrase Roadblock, he's the reason we call ourselves Joe. HCC 788 presents from 1964, G.I. Joe. This is G.I. Joe. This is among the first G.I. Joes introduced in 1964, and he was advertised as an action figure rather than a doll, and he was billed as America's movable fighting man. Action figure was a term coined by Hasbro for G.I. Joe, so this is the first G.I. Joe and the first real action figure. There were four basic G.I. Joe figures available in 1964. This is the action soldier. There was also the action marine, action sailor, and action pilot. They represented the four major branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. G.I. Joes of this era did not have individual names, but as they were being developed, they did have prototype names. There was Rocky for the soldier and marine, Skip for the sailor, and Ace for the pilot. That name, Ace, was later used in 1983 for G.I. Joe's fighter pilot. G.I. Joe in this form was available from 1964 to 1968, and he went through a lot of variations in the mold and the uniform. When when you opened the box for a G.I. Joe figure back in 1964, he came with a few things. He came with a dog tag, which is missing on mine, unfortunately. Uh, he had his fatigue hat, he had his fatigue shirt and pants, and he had his boots. You'd also get this army manual. Actually, there was a manual for each branch of service, and this is sort of like a combination catalog and instruction sheet. It lists all the great equipment that you could buy for G.I. Joe separately. It also has instructions instructions like here it shows how to fold the tent to put it in his backpack and here it has some instructions on how to remove the boots and we will have to try that out later but you may notice something the basic G.I. Joe figure did not come with any weapons his combat equipment had to be purchased separately that's because when G.I. Joe was introduced in the 60s it followed the so-called razor and razors marketing model and the basic idea is you sell the basic razor but you make your real money by selling replacement razors. In the G.I. Joe context, they would sell the basic figure, but they made their real money selling all the equipment you needed to fully play with the figure. In 1965, an African-American action soldier was issued, uh, and that was pretty forward-thinking and progressive for the 60s, but it was just the same basic figure mold in different colored plastic. In addition to the basic figure, I also have a Foot Locker sold separately, so we will look at the Foot Locker and some of his combat equipment. To look at the articulation on this figure, we have to take his uniform off. So let's get started with that. And we'll start with the hat, his fatigue cap. This hat is in olive drab and it features some sculpted on stitching on the brim and around the band. And that is not too bad, but it's not too detailed either. To take his shirt off, you've got to undo the snaps. So we're going to do that very carefully so the snaps don't tear away from the fabric. Then we kind of move the arms back and we carefully slide the shirt off of the arms. This is a pretty good authentic looking shirt with some faux pockets and some buttons and there's a tag on the inside that actually says G.I. Joe by Hasbro. Before we remove the boots I think we should consult the instructions. It says here, uh, boots off, grasp heel and gently pull boot from foot. Steady with other hand as you work boot off foot. Okay, let's give that a try. Okay, we're going to steady with one hand, and then it says to gently pull the heel of the boot from the foot. Gently. God damn it, son of a biscuit. Get out of there. And that's how you remove the boots. These boots are blow molded with a seam down the middle here, and we have sculpted laces and some sculpted stitching. Now, the earliest boots were brown. Uh, these are the more common black boots. Next, we remove the trousers with another snap, being very careful. We just slide those off. I'm not going to take a close look at the uh, combat fatigue pants because they're pretty plain. There are some variants of this. Uh, some of them have some nice uh, pockets on them, faux pockets 
pockets, uh, but these are pretty plain just in all of drab. And now the figure is naked. That's right, that just happened. Let's take a look at G.I. Joe's articulation, and he was advertised as having 20 points of articulation, but I only count 18 points of articulation. Uh, maybe you can count along and see if I'm missing something. He is articulated at the head, here at the neck, and with a great range of motion on the head. Uh, he's articulated here at the shoulder, a universal joint at the shoulder. He can move that all around. Uh, he has a swivel at the bicep, really right at the bicep, and perhaps this was a precursor to swivel arm battle grip introduced in the Real American Hero line in 1983. Uh, he has a hinge at the elbow so he can move at the elbow. Uh, he's articulated at the wrist so he can move at the wrist. He can also twist at the wrist, twist the hand at the wrist, not bad. Uh, he's articulated here at the torso, uh, pretty good range of motion there. Uh, then he has uh, balls at the hip uh, so he can move his legs around like that, but he also has kind of a thigh cut here so his uh, thighs can twist as well. So I'm counting that as two points of articulation there. Uh, then he has joints at the knee uh, and then again at the ankle he can move his ankle and he can also twist his ankle uh, and so really excellent articulation. Uh, not really just a good articulation for the time. I think this is good articulation for any era. To look at the main sculpted parts of this figure we can cover his nakedness. Uh, let's look at the sculpt design and color, really starting with his head, which is the main sculpted detail on the whole figure. This is one of the painted heads available in the 60s. Starting in 1970, they introduced flocked, lifelike hair. In 1964, the hair colors for G.I. Joe included blonde, brown, auburn, and black. And of course, this is the blonde-haired version. The blonde-haired G.I. Joe had brown eyes, and all of them had a scar on the right cheek. Uh, this was a distinctive mark for trade mark purposes and to distinguish G.I. Joe from the inevitable knockoffs. Other sculpted parts include the hands and the left hand is in this open C shape which may be familiar to fans of 1980s G.I. Joe. The right hand is the so-called nose picker hand with the thumb and forefinger in this pinching pose. Another oddity on this figure, the thumbnail on the right thumb is sculpted on the underside of the thumb and it was done this way uh, to identify knockoff figures that might be using the same mold. There is also a little bit of sculpted detail on the feet if you're into that kind of thing. The advertising said this face was sculpted from a composite of 20 different Medal of Honor winners. Well that is probably not true but it is a nice marketing gimmick. The Army Manual says you can move your G.I. Joe into positions that a real life soldier can assume and it has some examples here. Well let's test that out. Check. Check check, but I don't know why you'd ever want to do this, and check. As we've seen, the basic G.I. Joe figure did not come with a lot of stuff, but you could purchase separately a ton of authentic looking combat equipment, and you could also purchase the Foot Locker to store it all in. I do have the Foot Locker and some of his combat equipment, so let's take a look at it. This is the Foot Locker. Early Foot Lockers were made of wood, and they're pretty sturdy. Uh, they feature a metal latch and metal hinges and we have rope handles on the side. The lid featured a sticker with the G.I. Joe logo. That was the logo they used at the time. And then we have a space for name, rank, and serial number, which you could personalize. But the real fun begins when you open it up. Undo the latch and open the lid, and you have a tray with some storage spaces for the equipment. And on the inside of the lid, we have a sticker that shows how you can put the equipment in the tray. Here's a closer look at the sticker. The equipment was purchased separately and you could put it in the tray in this configuration. I do have the equipment in the tray just the way it shows here so let's take a look at it. In this corner we have an extra set of boots. Here we have binoculars with a black string for a strap. Here we have the first aid kit which is very small red plastic with a white cross on it. Next we have what I consider G.I. Joe's primary weapon. This is his M1 rifle 
pistol, and that is a very nice replica of the real world weapon. This one is missing the strap that should go along there, and it's got some scuffs on the butt here, but still a really nice replica of the real world M1. Next we have what the sticker calls a carbine, which looks to me like an M1 carbine with a strap here, and again this is a pretty good replica of the real world weapon. Next we have the bayonet some decent detail on the bayonet there and we have a ring there and we have a little notch there on the handle and that can attach to the carbine just put the barrel through the ring and put the notch on that tab right there and now you are equipped with a bayonet. Next we have the pistol and holster and the sticker just calls this a 45 pistol. It looks like it's a replica of the M1911A1 auto pistol. The holster is black and rubbery and it has this little knob here that attaches to the flap so you can open that up and it has a, a little red plastic wire here uh, and the pistol does fit the holster pretty well so G.I. Joe can carry his sidearm Next we have the belts, and I have a couple of different kinds here. I have one with a, kind of a lighter green and a darker green. Now both of these are later belts. Earlier belts had cloth pouches. These both have kind of plastic, uh, sort of rubbery uh, ammo pouches on them. Over here we have a helmet, and this helmet unfortunately is missing the strap. Next is the field telephone, which has a camouflage vinyl cover. And what's cool about this is it opens up and it actually has a telephone receiver uh, on a string. Here we have the fatigue hat which we've already seen. Here we have the canteen with the canteen cover and this is pretty cool. You can remove the cover and take the canteen out and the canteen has kind of a metal look to it with a black lid. This is the entrenching tool and unfortunately I do not have the entrenching tool cover that's supposed to go with it. Now this entrenching tool has three positions. This is the closed position. If you move it one click there, uh, it, this is the pick position and then you move it one more click to where it's fully open and this is the shovel position. Finally we have the mess kit and this mess kit is actually pretty cool. It has this handle that swings over the lid and latches. It's on a hinge but it comes off really easily. It can be popped on pretty easily too. Uh, it's a little bit annoying but you can take the lid off and if you take the lid off you actually have a tiny little fork and a tiny little spoon and a tiny little knife. That's just amazing detail. The tray itself came in a lot of variant colors. There are a lot of colors for this tray. But you take the tray out and there you have a ton of storage space for all of G.I. Joe's equipment. You could keep a ton of equipment in here and G.I. Joe had a lot of equipment. He had uniforms in different colors. Uh, he had uh, a snow cap here. Uh, we've got some more boots. This looks like one of the early release brown rubbery boots, but it has a split down the seam, unfortunately. Uh, we've got MP helmets. These are pretty cool. Uh, we've got more uniforms. Uh, the, the Green Beret set for G.I. Joe actually had a, a replica M16 rifle, and that looks very nice. We have scuba tanks. We have air vests, we've got hats, uh, just a ton of stuff, ski poles. And if you don't overload the Foot Locker with equipment, the figure will fit inside. Here's G.I. Joe decked out in some of his combat equipment. He has his helmet, he has his M1 rifle, he's got his pineapple grenades on his backpack strap, he's got his ammo belt, he's got his canteen, he's really ready for battle. The G.I. Joe figures from 1982, the first wave of 1980s G.I. Joe figures, had this sort of generic soldier look to them. And I can't help but think that maybe the designers at Hasbro were thinking more of the new G.I. Joe figures being specialized sort of generic soldiers like this rather than individual characters as they later became. In fact, if you give G.I. Joe the M16, he is very reminiscent of the 1982 infantry trooper Grunt. Looking at the 1982 G.I. Joes, you can see there's a little more science fiction than there was in the 19. 
1964 G.I. Joe. The 1960s G.I. Joe really emphasized authenticity, uh, but there was some military authenticity in 1982 G.I. Joes, and that's what I really liked about G.I. Joe. Apparently, that's also what collectors of G.I. Joe in the 1960s liked about it. In fact, I'll go out on a limb and say I could probably relate more to collectors of G.I. Joe in the 60s than I can to collectors of G.I. Joe in the 90s. The concept and basic design of G.I. Joe was by Stan Weston, and it was approved by Hasbro executive Don Levine. Weston's original idea could have gone in a different direction. It could have been a licensed product for the TV show The Lieutenant, but it's a good thing that it wasn't. Uh, the toy would have gone away when the show was canceled. Instead, Levine took the name of the figure from the story of G.I. Joe, the 1945 movie starring Robert Mitchum and Burgess Meredith. Burgess Meredith did voice acting for the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie. Now that could have been a nice way to bring G.I. Joe full circle back to its origin, but unfortunately the movie was just not very good. This really is the origin of the action figure. Without G.I. Joe, maybe there still would have been a Star Wars toy line and a Ninja Turtles and all the other toy lines that we know today, but they may have looked looked very different. Somebody first had to prove that boys would play with dolls. And let's be honest, whatever you want to call them, whether they're 12 inches or 3 and 3 quarter inches, they're still dolls. The earliest G.I. Joe stressed authenticity. In the late 60s though, the Vietnam conflict became less popular and military-based toys lost favor, so the focus changed to adventure. In the 1970s we got the adventure team, and G.I. Joe was decidedly less military, but the adventure team featured some innovations, such as the lifelike hair, the flocked hair and beard, and that was imported from the UK's version of G.I. Joe called Action Man. In 1974, they added Kung Fu Grip, which was rubbery hands that could grip, rather than these plastic hands that were frozen in one position. Those were also imported from the UK. In 1976, they got the Eagle Eye, which was a mechanism that could move the eyes left and right, which was honestly just really creepy. In the 70s, G.I. Joe spun away from reality. They introduced a superhero, Bullet Man, who frankly looked ridiculous. He had a bullet-shaped helmet and a unitard. And G.I. Joe had a rip-off of the $6 million man called Mike Power Atomic Man. Hasbro even made a knockoff of its own toy line. It made some non-G.I. Joe action figures called Defenders. They were G.I. Joe-sized figures with less articulation, and really, they were just cheap crap. Later, Hasbro introduced Super Joe. It was a last-ditch effort to keep G.I. Joe relevant. It ran from 1977 to 1978, and they were 8-inch figures instead of 12-inch figures. They were basically Mego-sized figures. Instead of innovating, Super Joe was trying to ride the coattails of more popular toys. It didn't work, and it killed the line. And G.I. Joe was dead until 1982. While G.I. Joe was dying, something else was happening. Fisher Price introduced Adventure People in the three and three quarter inch scale. The energy crisis had made petroleum products more expensive, so smaller action figures were more affordable. In 1977, Star Wars was a huge hit movie, and Kenner got the license to produce Star Wars action figures, and they did them in the Adventure People scale. And of course, they were a huge hit, and so three and three quarter inches became a standard for action figures through the rest of the 70s and the 1980s. In the post-Vietnam era, the U.S. was ready to look at military toys again, and G.I. Joe was relaunched in 1982. Now, the figures in 1982 were kind of generic looking figures, but they had individual backstories, and the universe for G.I. Joe was created by Marvel Comics and comic book writer Larry Hama. The file cards written for the figures by 
Larry Hama really excited the imagination of kids in the 80s. Back in those days, they were not allowed to use animation in toy commercials, so Hasbro used animation to advertise the comic books, and that in turn helped to sell the toys. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan's chairman of the FCC, Mark Fowler, deregulated rules for children's programming. That allowed toy-inspired cartoons to hit TV, including G.I. Joe and Masters of the Universe. From there, the marketing was really ramped up, and G.I. Joe was a huge success, and that was the G.I. Joe that I grew up with. So how do I assess this figure? I do like this guy. I like owning this figure. This is part of G.I. Joe history. Since it is part of history, it's almost irrelevant to criticize the aesthetics of it. I mean, really, who cares? It would be like saying you don't like the Duke of Wellington because he wore his hat fore to aft. So what? He defeated Napoleon. That's what matters. What matters for G.I. Joe is he became a legend, and the success of this toy line allowed Hasbro, years later, to revive him into the G.I. Joe that we grew to love. Looking closely at this toy, there were a couple things that could have been done better. I think the plastic hands that are frozen in that position were a little bit difficult to work with. The, the Kung Fu grip probably was an improvement. Also, you have to have a lot of patience with these guys. You have to be very patient and careful when you're changing out the uniforms and getting the weapons in his hand and getting him in the right position that you want him. It's actually kind of zen. You have to slow down and experience the G.I. Joe. Handling the action figure and all his gears, I can really see why kids in the 60s were blown away by this guy. I mean, all that authentic looking equipment, it just has the look and the feel of quality, and you can feel the workmanship in it. But that was the G.I. Joe of a previous generation. The G.I. Joe that I grew up with was very different. I think if Hasbro had just reissued the old G.I. Joe, uh, made some new 12-inch figures with updated equipment, I don't think the kids of my generation would have bought it. Instead, Hasbro created a new G.I. Joe that was laser-focused on my generation. But now my G.I. Joe is three decades old, and when I look at the future of G.I. Joe and what the next generation of G.I. Joe is going to be, I don't see it, and that worries me. What I have seen is G.I. Joe trying to ride a wave of 80s nostalgia, reissuing characters from my generation, updated, new sculpt, new articulation, but with few exceptions, I don't see kids playing with this stuff. I don't think it looks like it's meant for kids to play with. It looks like it's meant for guys my age to buy and put on a shelf. They are reissuing new versions of Cold War era toys, and that is not the future. That will never be the future. If there is to be a new generation of G.I. Joe, and that is by no means guaranteed, it will likely look very different from the G.I. Joe that I grew up with. There will probably be no snake eyes, no no Cobra, no Duke, maybe it's not even a team, it'll probably be something totally different. It may be as different from our G.I. Joe as our G.I. Joe was from the 1964 G.I. Joe. Maybe I won't even like the next generation of G.I. Joe, and you know what? That's fine. Don't make a G.I. Joe for me. Make a G.I. Joe for the kids. Uh, make a G.I. Joe that will capture the imagination of today's kids, not kids from the 80s. So G.I. Joe needs new ideas, but a new idea isn't necessarily a good idea. I mean, Sigma-6 was kind of a new idea, but I mean, this is why I don't give bonus points just for coming up with a new idea. I would think that if you looked at Sigma-6 before it was released, I think common sense should have told you that that was not a very good idea. I don't have any special respect for just throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. I mean, that's not innovating, that's guessing. To figure out which new ideas are good ideas, you have to think about them. It, it takes time and work and study and development by smart people, and I don't think that's happening right Right now. And without that, no cartoon series, no movie, no anything is going to bring us our next generation of G.I. Joe. That's why I don't lament Hasbro not having any new G.I. Joe this year. I think for G.I. Joe to be reborn, it probably needs to go away for a little while. And a lot of people probably don't want to hear that and probably vehemently disagree, but 
That's how I see it. I don't know what the next G.I. Joe is going to be like, but for those future developers who are going to create the new G.I. Joe, I have a couple suggestions. I think it is possible to have a successful American-centric product. I think the evidence of this is the recent Captain America movies. Uh, they are successful in the United States, but they're successful elsewhere too. The reason they're successful, I think, is first of all because they are top quality. There's no substitute for that, but also because they play on more universal values, and I think that is the key. If you make a product that is focused on American jingoism, I don't think the world's going to buy that, and I don't think Americans are going to buy that either. You can't just make a war toy. The world has just changed too much in the last 30 years. My next suggestion is don't be afraid to be relevant. Going back to the examples of the Captain America movies, uh, those movies had some relevant issues in them. Now, if all you wanted to see was the action, uh, that's fine. It didn't beat you over the head with them. But security versus privacy, preemption, those were issues that were raised in those movies, and those are issues that are relevant to modern times. They, they weren't afraid to take a position and have a message. So don't be afraid to say something. The message shouldn't be overbearing, but you don't have to produce a line that is so watered down that it doesn't have any substance. Say something, and that will attract the more intelligent fans. And I think G.I. Joe has always attracted the more intelligent kids, because of course of course you could just play war with it, but if you look closer, it has more to it. It has substance. Finally, bear in mind the changes in the market. Nowadays, the kids that play with plastic toys tend to be the younger kids, and the kids that would enjoy the new G.I. Joe are probably a little bit older, and those kids tend to play more with video games than with toys. So the main focus may need to be on media rather than plastic. Now, I do believe, at least I hope, that there will someday be a new G.I. Joe toy line. But the main focus may not be on the toys. And you know what? That's okay, because you're making it for the next generation. You're not making it for me. I may be totally wrong about everything, but that's how I see the future. And today, looking at the past has kind of given us a launching point to look at the future. I want to thank everyone who made G.I. Joe such a success back in the 60s. Without you guys, none of us would be doing this. We, we would have no future to talk about. So thank you for buying G.I. Joe and loving G.I. Joe and spending all those hours playing with the toy and changing his uniform and taking his clothes off and playing with your little naked man. Sinner. But next week, we are going to get back to the 80s, and it's been a long time since we have looked at Cobra. So we are going to look at the bad guys. It is Cobra's time to shine. Until then, like this video on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, share this video. That's what keeps this channel going. And always remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man from head to toe, on the land, on the sea, in the air. G.I. Joe, attack! Boom, boom! G.I. Joe, take the hill! Bam, bam! Terrific battle! Terrific equipment to have a battle with. When you get G.I. Joe and the authentic G.I. Joe equipment, you'll have the greatest realism, the greatest fun you ever had in playing soldier. Box after box of authentic uniforms and equipment so you can change your G.I. Joe soldier into a camouflage marine ready for battle, a Navy frogman with complete scuba suit and inflatable life raft, an Air Force pilot with high-altitude helmet and air vest, Get G.I. Joe and get G.I. Joe equipment so you can set up exciting battle action whenever you want. Remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.